Hi, Pastor Blair here, and I'm so glad that you've tuned in to use this resource, and we hope and pray that it's a blessing for you. We also pray that you would use this resource in conjunction with and participation in your local church. Discipleship was never meant to be done in isolation, and this resource was never meant to replace your participation and involvement in your local church. The local church is where we grow, and we grow as disciples of Jesus, and we see the forward progress of the gospel in our lives. Now, if this resource has been helpful for you, would you consider giving back to help us continue to make resources and continue to develop the quality of our resources? You can give financially at compassregina.com. And most importantly, we just treasure and covet your prayers. So we are in this short series uh, just over Christmas. I love Christmas. I'm with my own family. I know that's not the case for everyone. Sometimes Christmas and uh, you just don't know what to do and it's a weird family time. But for me, it's been, I love Christmas. And I have fond memories of, of my grandma's house and the, uh, the red, green, and white candies she had in bowls all over the house and all these little ceramic Christmas reindeer and all these things she had. Fond memories for me and, and fond memories of me growing up in my home even with our own kids, you know, especially when they're younger, when it's Christmas is super exciting, and uh, now they're a little older, and it's, it's, it's still exciting, but it's just not the same as when they're, when they're a little younger. So I have great memories. But Christmas is a time of peace, right? You hear it in the songs we sang this morning. You hear it in the songs you hear on the radio in the coming weeks. If you, if you pick up a card, you're going to see lots of cards around the idea of the proclamation of peace during this time of year, even... Luke's account of Jesus' birth recounts an angel saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Is peace even possible? Because, let's face it, when you look around the world in recent history, this is amazing to try to wrap your head around. The 20th century was the most murderous in recorded history. The total number of deaths be 187 million people dead. Imagine that. That's, a, that's the equivalent of 10% of the world's population in 1913. So when you look around the world, it begs the question, missing peace, we're going to talk about peace, or we're going to try to, uh, to unpack that a little bit more. Peace, uh, one that um, we want to hear at Christmas, I think. It's, it's one that, uh, for many, where, where is that peace? You look around, you wonder if it's even possible. So, we're all trying to wrap our minds around sometimes this idea of political peace or, I don't know, peace just seems so elusive at times. Well, the prophet Isaiah looked to the arrival of what was called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. So this is 700 years before Jesus was, was a babe in a manger. And this is what we read. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace, on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and do up for more. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So the arrival of Jesus, if you, if you read through the New Testament and you follow Jesus' ministry, often you'll, you'll see him greet people with peace be with you. Or This idea of peace is throughout the Bible. Peace in our homes. We want peace in our hearts. But we, we, we long for peace and discover what God's word has to tell us about what uh, this morning and I this morning and I uh, prompt and to, to, to poke at our hearts in ways perhaps that uh, prompt and to, to, to poke at our hearts in ways perhaps that where we can really reflect on what peace is. I want you to, uh, to turn to Isaiah chapter 26. Um, it, it, Isaiah is the book of the Bible. Uh, it's a, called a major prophet and it has the most chapters of, of any book in the Bible. So you, 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 will, you shouldn't have any trouble finding it. So as you're turning there, I want to show you a picture that I think you're going you're gonna to recognize. Okay, let me show you this picture here, because it's a picture that uh, you recognize Christmas movie, Home Alone. We watch it every year. Uh, it's, it's, a great, it's a great movie. Now, now, if you look at his face, does it remind you of anything? He's scared, right? He's scared, that's true. Well, this, this was inspired, this look from Home Alone was inspired by this painting, okay? 
Let me show you this. Okay, that's true. I mean, that was he was inspired. They were inspired to have him do. It's, it was was painted in 1893 by Edward Munch. Uh, the masks that uh, the Scream movie series, the horror, that's based on this as well. All right, so so this is kind of a, a, a painting that has influenced uh, our culture in different ways. Now, what's interesting about this painting is when you look at it, you see this agonizing face, this dressed out, and and. It sort of symbolizes, and this was, this was the motivation for the painting, it symbolizes the anxiety of the human condition, All right? And so this man, uh, Edward Mush, he, he was a man, he was, he, in fact, there's a little known uh, thing about this painting that you probably haven't seen before, but if you were to see this painting in real life and you were to look at the top left corner, you, it might be hard to see, I'm going to show you a little snippet up here. This is in the top left corner of this painting. Uh, and, and, and you can kind of see some pencil written out there. But this is what the painter, this is the painter, and he wrote this on his painting, and it says this, can only have been painted by a madman. Could only have been painted by a madman. That's what he wrote in pen. Now, this isn't the kind of painting that you might uh, give to someone or you might even think about when it comes to peace. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't shout out peace. It's, it shouts out anxiety. It shouts out uncertainty. And as we look at Isaiah, and when Isaiah was written, it was also written in a time uh, of history where there was a lot of Isaiah prophesied at 26 city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. Verse 3, Keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. In the Bible, God mentions peace over 400 times in the Bible. It's, it's, it's an indication that this is a pretty high agenda for God. And he wants to confer this idea of peace upon his people. He wants us to have it. Searching understanding of peace from a biblical perspective. Okay, so watch this. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence. Peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a sleeted sap, so no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of complete animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer bring shalom, literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships in the book of King Shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting. It also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were severely happy. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom. And his reign would bring shalom. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others. Like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the apostle Paul can say, Jesus himself is our Irene. He gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond. Becoming people of peace means participating in his, his peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives. All right, so there's a lot in there, right? And, and some of you are sitting here and you're thinking on your way here today with your spouse. Now you're thinking to yourself, Oh boy, we need to have shalom. 
because it was a rough start to the day, right? I'm sure some of you have been there because I've been there. So there's a lot that we can learn about peace from the word of God. It describes the situation, peace of God. Okay, so let's look at peace with God. What does that mean? Well, Romans 5.1 says this, ship to all those who surrender to him in faith. Peace, peace with God is available to every believer who surrenders their lives to Jesus. Luke 2.14 says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So when the angels proclaimed peace on earth, they were speaking primarily of a very personal, individual application of God's peace that grows out of a firsthand knowledge of the Prince of Peace. That personal relationship with Jesus, that understanding that in Adam, as, as 1 Corinthians 5, 15 talks about, that in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Sin, in Adam we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Ephesians 2, 1 says, and you are dead in your one man in death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. So it's the th- thing with sin is it, it's, it spreads to all of humanity. We, we all have this nature of sin. So there's this brokenness between us and God. So Jesus comes to restore for us peace with God so that we can be restored and we're no longer alienated. And Psalms 120, which is on the video, and, and through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven and on. When you, have, when you surrender your life to Jesus, you, you are in a position in you of right standing before God. You have been reconciled to him. You have peace with through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Romans 5, a peace treaty. All right, so, well, kind of visualize it like this, okay? As flawed as this illustration may be, brother. so brokenness because of sin due to us, and instead poured out his righteousness on us so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see us in our sin. He sees the work of Jesus dying upon peace with an enemy to a place of being uh, at peace with God. Restored relationship through the cross. An enemy to a place of being uh, at peace with God. Restored relationship through the cross. Romans, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Charles Spurgeon explains it like this. He says, there's no, no quarrel now between God and those who are in Christ Jesus. Peace is made be. Ephesians 2 says this, now in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly far off have been brought to who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. This sacrifice once and for all, for all of us, is what brought peace for his people and establish that union we have with with God. So that's peace with God. We have peace with God through the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus. The peace of God is is a little bit different. Okay, so peace with God. You tracking with me? All right. Peace of God. Let's look at that. Let's unpack that for a second. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace. Let not your hearts be troubled, Neither let them be afraid. The peace, the peace of God is peace with your circumstances. Even when your circumstances aren't what you'd ever want them to be. You been there? Yeah, right? We, we've, we all have experiences in our lives where we have these situations where we're, where we're in, in something, whether it's a sickness or a loss or some job situation where There's just, we have the most horrible circumstances. The peace of God helps us to establish and know peace in the midst of our circumstances. Philippians 4, uh, 6 and 7 says this. Now, now Paul is is preaching, all right, so just picture that, understand that. Paul is in prison with some of his words. He says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, and with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now understand where Paul is when he's in jail, awaiting his execution. The peace of God, as, as, as we see in this, God says, 
I will give you your portion of peace that you need, and I will even give you more than the peace that you need in the midst of your circumstances. That's perfect peace. Many of you know, and, and I appreciate uh, your prayers for my brother presently dying of cancer and every to, to journey with, with him and his wife, Kelly. And man, it's just, it's so difficult. But you know, sometimes I look at his situation, but then it exudes the peace of God in the midst of horrible circumstances and tremendous pain God, to me. As I, as I watch him walk through this, Jesus himself said, of trouble. That's what Jesus said. Okay, peace means that you're not going to struggle in relationships. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have a fight with your spouse. It doesn't mean that you're not going to, peace doesn't mean you're not going to have a difficult time. Now, we need to understand that peace isn't found in the absence of problems, but, pe- of problems, but, pe- right? Peace is God's presence. It's it's God's perspective. It's God's assurance. Even as you say this, the real challenge of the Christian life is not to eliminate every sovereign, powerful God in every difficulty. And those who honor him by trusting him experience the peace of God from Scripture. Well, let's, let's look at a couple things, okay? The first one is this. The battle for peace begins in your mind. There's a war in your mind. There's a battlefield going on in your mind. So, so you know what a battlefield? In a battlefield, what's the goal of a of a battle? Is you want to try to you want to try to take take more of the land, right? You want to keep pushing forward, and 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 as you push forward, right? You 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 make sure that you you have the right people in the right places to make sure that there's a good picture of what the battlefield of the mind is like. We have to. We have to know the truth of God. So in order for us to experience what are from the untruths that are constantly being whispered in our ear at every turn. See, I can believe, you see the battlefield of the mind. There's a war going on in our minds between what God says and what peace begins. The field begins in the mind. All right? it's, our minds need to be focused on the truths of God. The Hebrew word, that that's translated stayed in, in, in Isaiah here. It, it means um, to lean on completely. To lean on completely. It means to fully rest oneself upon. So, you know, when my kids are were little, you know, when we we're in a, an environment or at, at something where they felt a bit anxious or or um, or scared or whatever, they they would often come and they would lean they would lean into you know on my leg or grab on you know or grab a hand you know that kind of thing. They they. They, they did that because they understood that they wanted to, to, to lean into something bigger and stronger than they were. And, and that's the same with God. Um, we, we lean into him with our mind. We, we, lean, we lean into God with our minds. And that's how you can literally translate this verse. You will have perfect peace when you lean completely on, when your mind is resting on God's promises. Is our... Uh, willingness to believe that God's promises are them. Perfect peace is when you're following promises. It's best, isn't it best to put your hope in the very thing that you know will not fall in one basket? Put it in the basket that's, that you are sure will not fail. And you lean into that. We're to love the Lord your God with all of our minds, Scripture says in Matthew 20, 22. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind in Romans 12. We can have the mind of Christ in 1 Corinthians 2. This doesn't mean we ability to discern spiritual things that an unbeliever cannot understand or see. So God gives us them right now. What you don't like, what you dread, that annoying person on social media, delete. You'll be kept in perfect peace, those whose mind is fixed on God. Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Again, Paul from prison. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So when you think of other people, 
does your mind automatically go to the worst case scenario or do you actually try to think the very best of people? Right? A lot of times we think of someone, we received a text, and of course, texts are, we interpret them a hundred different ways. And we always seem to interpret them in ways that are negative. Can you believe that this person said this? Can you believe, and all of a sudden you're off in another world and this one line text becomes a novel and all of a sudden, you know? No, we need to think the best of people. Just think the best of them. We need to think about whatever's pure, whatever is lovely. We need to have that kind of mind. So when your mind is fixed on God, when your mind is fixed on him, you're fixed on what is true and what is right. It's admirable and worthy of praise. The God of peace will be with you. And when the God of peace is with you, your, your, your mind is fixed on him. You're leaning into him. It's really important. So this is what Jesus said in John 14, 27. It's so powerful. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Now notice this. Jesus says, my peace, he's giving you his peace. His peace. And peace is not found in the absence of problems. Peace is found in the presence of God. So whatever it is that you're going through, and a lot of you are going through some hard things, loss of a loved one, job situations, all kinds of struggles and temptations, all going through hard things. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's the peace of God. It's his peace to us. You see that? It's not the peace of the world. It's not the peace of having enough money in the bank. It's, it's, it's not... It's not the, the peace that everything's going to go the way you want it to go to you. So peace isn't the absence of heartache. It's not the absence of loss. It's not being your thoughts on him. Think about what is good. Think about what's pure. And as you focus on the one who is peace and the one who is always good, cast your care. We begin by... Your mind will stay on whatever it is that you're trusting in. Your mind will stay there. Peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. If you trust in money, that's what you'll think about. If you trust in in a relationship, that's where your mind will be. But when you trust on the Lord and you stay focused and keep your mind on him, that's where your thoughts will be. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. So the word for for lean in Proverbs 3, 5, it comes from the same root word that's in Isaiah 26. It's this, this idea that when we trust in God, we don't lean on our own understanding, but we lean into God. We lean into him for peace. We trust in him. We're sustained by him. We're established by the Lord to trust him and we're upheld by him. It's that leaning into, all right, that idea of leaning into when things are bad. So the battle for trust, it begins in our minds. If we trust in the Lord, it will show in our actions, but it will begin in our mind. It begins in our mind. So whatever we focus on will dictate our actions. If, if our world revolves around trusting in money, for example, then your life's pursuit will be to, to, to beef up that very thing that you about you know, the, the almighty dollar and, and your relationship with God will be put to the side because that's not where your trust is. Your trust is in focus, focus, energy. Energy really matters. But when we focus on God's priorities, our actions will follow and will reflect different priorities. Okay? And, and source of trust is not in some, you know, bellhop in the sky. Our source is in the dependability of 26, Isaiah 26. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock, an everlasting rock. Trust in the Lord forever. Because the promises of of Isaiah 26 were encouraged to trust in the Lord forever and therefore receive the blessing of his promise, perfect peace. So if the Lord calls us to rely on him completely with our mind, because he is everlasting strength, 
That's why we trust in him. It's that he is ever cured by this, this by himself. Isn't that he is an everlasting rock that doesn't change with the culture and the shifting sands of our world? He is sure. Anything other than what he would say he would do would make him a liar. So God is not a liar. He is the source of our trust. And he is the... So we have peace with God. That's what we're celebrating. We're celebrating the fact that we remember every time we gather together each week, we remember that because of Christ's saving work, we have peace with God. And we remember, we celebrate that with communion. And the experience comes, comes from the work of Christ, that we can have peace with of God, right? It's the peace, peace in our circumstances, whatever those circumstances are, whatever it is that you're going through, it's experiencing the peace of God in the midst of those things. There's a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. And he's always been an example to me among many examples in my life of a, of a man who, uh, who really had a peace, the peace of God. And his son died of scarlet fever. A year later, 19th in as it were, to go to meet his wife who survived the shipwreck with his, his do- four daughters died. His wife survived. His son, everything was, everything was gone. Everything was gone. And as he was on this ship, and he's crossing the Atlantic, and he's going to Europe, to went to, uh, around the spot of God in this very feelings, the things he was feeling from his heart. When sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, death of my son, all my has taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. That's the peace of God. 